What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think in the comment section below. Also, if you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video today, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to get into another mafia topic. And one of the great films in mafia movie history is the great Donnie Brasco. And it would talk about Special Agent Joe Pistone infiltrating the Bonanno crime family, a story that we all know and love. Today, we're going to talk about one of the people involved in that infiltration, a man portrayed in the film by Al Pacino. We're going to talk about the real story behind the man, the story of Lefty Guns Ruggiero next on Sit Down Shorts. Benjamin Ruggiero was born April 19th, 1926 in Lower Manhattan. He would actually be from the sprawling housing complex of Knickerbocker Village. Now, we've discussed Knickerbocker Village before. In fact, many members of the Bonanno crime family would hail from Knickerbocker Village, including Alfred Embarado, Anthony Mira, Richard Cantarella, and Nikki Marangello. All these individuals will come up in the sprawling housing estate. Now, for Mr. Uh, Ruggiero, Lefty Guns, he would actually live on the seventh floor of 10 Monroe Street and would actually live near Tony Mira. Now, for the gravelly-voiced Ruggiero, he would gain that infamous uh, gravelly voice from the cigarettes he would smoke, uh, in essence, really from a teenager. Lefty Guns grew up smoking. And one thing that Lefty Guns loved to do, like many gangsters, Lefty enjoyed gambling. And gambling would be a major problem for Lefty Guns throughout his career. It would really become a big issue for him, something that became uncontrollable and really disallowed him from ever truly becoming a great earner. He definitely made money. He was definitely a power uh, in the family, but he was someone that could never really get out in front of his addiction to gambling. Now, as a young adult, uh, Lefty Guns would slot in under the tutelage of Capo Regime and the Bonanno family, Michael Sabella. And if you know anything about Little Italy, Michael Sabella is a known uh person in that area. Sabella at one point owned a restaurant called Casa Bella, and he was integral in uh, the Bonanno crime family really until the early 80s. Um, and once Carmen Galanti was taken out, Sabella was chopped down a little bit, but Sabella was a longtime member of the Bonanno crime family. For uh, Lefty Guns, he would learn mob politics from Mike Sabella, and for his entire life, Lefty Guns Ruggiero was, quote, a stickler for the rules of the mafia. He was adamant about abiding by the rules. He was a gangster's gangster through and through. That was one thing about Lefty Guns we could always respect. He truly was a gangster and early in his life learned that you must follow the rules in this life. And in the end, if you are betrayed, you have to take care of your betrayer. But in the end, if you are betrayed, you've got to take what you have coming to you like a man. Lefty Guns would take on the particular interests of a mobster. He would be very active early in his career in bookmaking, loan sharking, and extortion. And he would actually become very involved in the Fulton Fish Market. As we know, the Fulton Fish Market is not far uh, from the bridges. As we see in the background there, uh, the full fish market is very close to where Lefty Ruggiero grew up. In fact, Lefty Guns actually owned uh, and had an interest in a fishery inside of Fulton Fish Market and at one point was able to create a no-show job for himself. It was estimated that at one point, Lefty Guns Ruggiero was uh, offering and earning about $5,000 uh, a month from a no-show job that he had in the Fulton Fish Market for him. It allowed him to purchase a social club uh, in this area of Madison Street in lower Manhattan, not far from his home on Monroe Street. So uh, he was operating very much out of that two bridges area uh, of lower Manhattan, not far from the financial district, not far from the seaport. Um, and an area that if you know anything about the Bananos, they had been very rife 
uh, with leadership in. The Genovese had people down there. PD Red D. Chiara had a social club down in that area for a long period of time. Uh, and for people in Nicaragua Village, as we know, the Bonanno family was always uh, very involved. As I said, the problem that lefty guns Ruggiero had throughout his life was gambling. In fact, he was a big horse better. And this would catch up to him really in uh, the early parts of his career. At one point, it was estimated that he had owed about $160,000 to Nikki Glass's Marangello. Now, Marangello operated a social club, the Toyland Social Club at 94 Hester Street in Chinatown. Marangello was very integral in the family as well. And he started taking out uh, and giving loans to Lefty Ruggiero. And in fact, at one point, Lefty became a very capable soldier and or associate. They proposed membership to Lefty Guns. Now, Marangello would say that basically until he paid back the $160,000, he could not be made into the Bonanno crime family. Eventually, he would pay most of it back. And in 1977, Lefty Guns Ruggiero would become a member of the Bonanno crime family. But by 1978, he began owing money to Marangello again. And at one point, Marangello would actually start taking uh, part of uh, Lefty Guns' interest in different mob activities to be, uh, be paid back in full. So Lefty Guns had major problems with uh, gambling throughout his life. As we know, uh, Lefty Guns was very close with Anthony Mira, who he grew up with in Knickerbocker Village. At one point in the mid-70s, Lefty uh, was introduced to an individual uh, called Donnie. Now, Donnie had been introduced to him through Anthony Mira. Mira had basically said that Donnie uh, was a jewel thief and a guy that could be a capable earner. And for Lefty Guns, he had taken a liking to Donnie. Uh, during the late 70s, Mir would actually go away to prison, and Donnie would slot in to Lefty Guns. At one point, uh, he took a liking and actually became very close to Donnie Brasco, as he was referred to on the streets. Uh, so for Lefty Guns, things were good. He was making money. He did have a gambling problem, but... Uh, he was a soldier in the Bonanno crime family. He was a capable guy, and he started to earn more money with his new friendship uh, with Donnie Brasco. He was all, also very involved with bookmaking that he did out of his club on Madison Street. So things were good for him. By this point in his family life, Lefty Guns would actually uh, marry a woman called Lorraine. He had actually been married in the 50s uh, to a woman, but at this point, he had actually succeeded his marriage there and become involved with Lorraine. He would be married to her in 1977. He would be so close to Donnie Brasco, who'd actually has Donnie to be the best man in his wedding. Uh, Lefty Guns would have four children, including a daughter who at one point married a man called Marco. At one point, this man, Marco, who had interest in Florida and was an associate of the Bonanno crime family, had actually taken money off the top of the Bonanno crime family. The Bonanno's told Lefty Guns he needed to take out his son-in-law. Now, Marco uh, would be reported missing, and his body was never found. Lefty was very well known as a capable hitter as well. This is the kind of guy, guys, that throw these families uh, in motion. These are the guys in the lower ends, the lower echelon that are making money. They're killing people. They're taking care of the trash. Lefty Guns wouldn't even waver, even if it involved killing members of his family. Now, Lefty Guns also had a son called Thomas. Now, Thomas had a major heroin problem and is actually talked about in the film Donnie Brasco, if you remember. He always had a heroin dependency. We'll actually talk about him a little bit later, but he always was a constant problem for Lefty Guns Ruggiero. Now, uh, as we know, Lefty becomes uh, particularly close with Donnie Brasco. The problem for Lefty was eventually Tony Mira would get out of jail. And in the Bonanno crime family, Mira had called upon Brasco as an associate of his. So he had taken him under his wing. It caused a big problem in the Bonanno family. In whereas Lefty at this point uh, had claimed Donnie. Mira had been gone for years, uh, and ultimately through several sit-downs, he would actually win over Donnie Brasco under his tutelage. At one point, Lefty would respond, quote, I want this fucking guy's head when it came to Mira. He was very loyal to Donnie, and he was going to do what he had to do 
continue to maintain his friendship and business connection with Donnie Brasco. By the end of the 70s, the Bonanno family had their own issues. As we know, um, the three capos were starting to try to take over control of the family after Carmen Galanti was killed in 1979. By this point, Dominic Sonny Black Napolitano had taken over Capo regime in the family after uh, the old friend to uh, Lefty Guns, Mike Sabella, was demoted. Donnie Brasco, Lefty Guns, and other members of the Bonanno family uh, were thrown in under the leadership of Dominic Sonny Black Napolitano. So now Napolitano started taking a liking uh, to Donnie Brasco as well. So everyone involving uh, Donnie Brasco was involved now with Sonny Black out of the Motion Lounge in Brooklyn, New York. Now, um, as we know, in the film Donnie Brasco, one of the major wrong points of the film is that during the three capos hit, the one that we talked about, the ones that many people know about, where uh, members of the Bonanno family killed Philip Giancone, Dominic Trinchera, and Sonny Ren and Delicato. In the film, it would state that Donnie Brasco was there on the day of the murder. There are a couple of things wrong about this hit. In the film, uh, they display that Lefty's actually shooter in the film. That's not true. Lefty Guns was actually outside of the home that day and acted as a lookout alongside another man, John Sirisani. Also, throw in the fact uh, Donnie Brasco was not at the hit. He was not there. It never happened. It was really just thrown in uh, as a big time part of the movie that didn't actually happen. So it actually happened that part, but Donnie wasn't there and Lefty was actually outside. He was not involved with the actual shooting itself. Now, during the early 80s, things would really start to come down. Uh, for Lefty Guns Ruggiero. At that point in 1981, um, by the time the three coppers had been hit in May of that year, by July, uh, the FBI had realized that their longtime uh, employee, Donnie Brasco, was starting to have some issues. Uh, the family was actually calling upon him to take on murders. They wanted to make him made man. The FBI would pull him out of the operation. And on in July of 1981, the FBI would go to the Motion Lounge and tell not only Lefty Guns, but Sonny Black, that Donnie Brasco was actually Special Agent Joseph Pastone. We know the story. At that point, there were wiretaps and surveillance showing L Ruggiero and Sonny Black. They were basically in cahoots that the FBI was just playing games that there was no way that Donnie uh, was an FBI informant or an FBI employee, and they refused to believe it, actually. Uh, they did not want to believe that their friend for so long, uh, Donnie Brasco, was actually a federal uh, employee and had been playing them for years. Uh, Sonny Black was actually very uh, sorrowful about his um, you know, playing with the devil in a way. He would tell a girlfriend that right before he would die that you know, he was heartbroken that his friend was actually uh, an FBI agent. Um, these guys got played. The thing about all of these individuals, whether it's Anthony Mira, Sonny Black, or Lefty Guns, they all took their punishments like men. And the Bonanno family had to deal with this. This was a major embarrassment. They allowed an FBI agent into the echelons of their family, and they had to be dealt with. And they were dealt with. Uh, Anthony Mira would ultimately be killed in lower Manhattan as he sat in the car uh, of his cousin, Richard Cantarella, who uh, ended up whacking him. Cantarella would ultimately come, become an FBI informant. For Sonny Black, he would be killed in 1981, August of 1981. He would be uh, asked to go to the home of an associate, Ronald Filicomo. Uh, he had obviously knew his fate. He would tell a bartender right before to hold on to his valuables. He likely wouldn't be coming back. He didn't. He took it like a man uh, and was shot in the basement of the home. After the gun malfunctioned uh, that was supposed to kill Napolitano, Napolitano would, quote, respond to his shooters, quote, do it right this time. They did. They would shoot him in the head and he would die at the scene. Now for lefty guns, Ruggiero, about two weeks later, he would be summoned to a meeting in Brooklyn. As he walked into the meeting, 
the FBI would actually arrest him as he walked into the meeting. And for once, maybe Lefty was happy he was arrested, but like a good gangster, you're never happy when you're arrested. He probably, though, was saved. Uh, the FBI would arrest him and charge him with multiple RICO counts, uh, as well as drug trafficking as well. And they would tell him many times, look, you were played. Uh, Donnie uh, Brasco is an agent. Uh, he's uh, not actually your friend. Uh, he couldn't believe it. He didn't want to believe it. In fact, he would tell his lawyer, there's no way Donnie is an agent. Uh, though eventually the FBI would try to get uh, Lefty Guns to cooperate. They would ask him multiple times to cooperate. He would decline every time. They would tell him basically, look, if you go back on the street, you're a dead man. Uh, Lefty Guns wouldn't waver. He was a gangster through and through. And whether you respect these people or not, you must respect Lefty Guns as a man. He believed in his mafia oath so strongly that even an FBI agent he would not waver against. He wouldn't do it. He would go to jail like a man and do his time. At one point at the trial uh, during his conspiracy uh, in 1982, he would say, quote, I'll get that motherfucker Donnie if it's the last thing I do. Ultimately, lefty guns Ruggiero would get 15 years in federal prison and would head off. He would ultimately do 11 years. In 1984, lefty guns would get some bad news. In January of that year, his son Thomas was found shot to death in a car alongside another Bonanno associate, Joseph Chile. They would be shot multiple times, and the police would chalk it up as a drug dispute. The end would come very early for the longtime son of Ruggiero. This was his end. It was what he always would have to deal with. His heroin dependency always was a problem. Now, for lefty guns, he would ultimately beat the government and get out of prison in 1993. By that point, though, he was suffering from lung and testicular cancer. Keep in mind, he had been smoking cigarettes since his early teens, and they had caught up to him. In 1994, of no uh, November of 1994, Lefty Guns Ruggiero would die of cancer. As we know, in 1997, uh, the film Donnie Brasco would come out. In the film, Ruggiero would be played by famed actor Al Pacino. And I will say this, one thing about the character in the film, he did play him pretty well, as we see. Um, there were some things that were untrue about Lou Ruggiero at the end. In the end, he was a gambling addict, um, but he was not cranking uh, parking meters for change and things of that nature. He actually was a pretty good earner, and he was a stone-cold gangster. That's the one thing that they got very right about him in the film. Uh, later in life, uh, his name would actually resurface. Uh, the granddaughter of Lefty Ruggiero, Ramona Rizzo, would actually appear in multiple seasons of the VH1 TV show Mob Wives. Now, Ramona Rizzo would talk very eloquently about her grandfather uh, and would give him nothing but respect. In my opinion, she was the best looking one on the show. It's that simple. Uh, in the end, though, Lefty Guns Ruggiero uh, is um, a man that we must respect. Uh, he was a killer, he was a criminal, and he was a gangster. But in the end, he took all of his punishments. In the end, it is also something that must be discussed. Multiple times in prison, Lefty Guns was offered over a million dollars to tell his story by movie uh, directors and book writers. He declined every time. He would never betray his mob oath. And the mafia did one good thing. Ultimately, they would give Lefty Guns a pass if he took his punishment like a man and never cooperated. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and make sure you subscribe so you never miss another episode. As always, we'll see you next time.